Oh, when you touch me like this, and when I hold you like that, you know who that is. Celine Dion! Oh my god, Celine oh my god. Dion! Welcome to the Celine Dion Split Screen Gaming Podcast. <laughs> We're not the games. weekly podcast where we're only talking about Celine Dion. We're three best friends, all Celine Dion, gather around and talk about video <laughs> games from the comfort of each other's homes. Yo soy Chad Michael Linus, Te amo. Holden Depardo. Look at that bilingual motherfuckingness. I just right assumed there. that you said when you your name or I don't even know what you said, I just assumed it was to intro myself. Yo soy I don't speak Spanish, but Yo soy is I am. However, I think it might be like I physically am, not like I am called or my name is. So it might know. be like I am a cup. But I don't have to oh, say cup. Okay. Well, you are a cup though. That is a very Los pollos hermanos. Hey guys, welcome back. We have a couple of things, a cool thing today, Vita retrospective. First yeah. birthday, R.I.P. R.I.P. S. Vita. Um, Hopefully not. We have two more things we want to mention. One, I apologize for all the construction noise going on on my end of the podcast. You're going to hear it throughout. There's just a bunch of people working on the apartment above mine. It's going to happen. Fucking deal with it. It hasn't been too bad from us talking so far. Um, good, off good, the good. Podcast. I'll try to do some like post work to, on it too. Two, but there are some big announcements related yes. to us. If you've been following our social media, you know that we have some big changes coming up. Those will be happening in two weeks on February 27th. We will announce what those changes are next Tuesday. But I wanted to alert you that the name of the podcast itself and the name of our social media stuff Mm -hmm. might be changing to that by next Tuesday. So don't freak out if you look down and you're like, oh, my God, this isn't what I remember split screen gaming podcast being called. And they're like, listen, motherfucker, it's not called podcast. It's a podcast. <laughs> but you should stay subscribed and share it with your friends. Yeah. This is always kind of a temporary name for us. We always knew we were going to change it. And we've made some changes. Well, shut up. We're going to say why next week. We're going to go into in depth all of it. And it's going to be so fucking exciting. And <laughs> tune in definitely on the 27th for our inaugural episode of the new relaunch because we're going to have some money opportunities. If you guys like money, you can have money <sighs> for doing I don't know. nothing. I don't know if money – people care about money, do you think? I don't money, know. Money, 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 money! What's the market research on that, that people like money? I don't know. Yo soy an Americano de gusta money. Okay, Dinero. <laughs> <laughs> um, clearly, you don't speak Spanish because even I didn't understand that, and I'm fluent Clearly, Spanish, you're nuts. We've been over. That's the joke, right? Clearly, you're nuts. Uh, okay, Chad. More importantly, I want to know what you've been playing this week. I know you. What just have Shadow I the been Colossus. playing this week? I have only played Shadow of the Colossus this week. Not the Surge. Nothing of the Surge. I did not play any of the Surge this week. I haven't had a lot of games time to play games this week. But any time I had was devoted to Shadow of the Colossus. I am fifteen of sixteen Colossi in. You are farther than I am then. Well, sixteen is the last one, and I wanted to stop there. And actually, I'm going back now and getting trophies like. Defeat one with a downward jumping stab and defeat this one in an alternate way. Excuse me, I had to burn there's, almost. There's um, some really tough trophies. There's one, um, I think it's the eighth Colossi, where Colossi... Hey, there's no spoilers, no spoilers. It's not a spoiler on it. It's, it's, a, it's a trophy, and it's very hard to get. It flips over, you have to like, flip it over somehow. Oh, Holden. Holden. It's not there's a spoiler. A reason, it is a spoiler because the trophy itself is hidden for a reason, because it contains okay. spoilers about how to defeat that boss. Okay, fine. Oh my god. Well, anyway, there's something well, you, you already have... said it, so talk about it. <laughs> you have you have to find a way to flip it over and the way you kill it is apparent once you flip it over. I think mean, there's at least spoilery like When you get. flip it I over it say, becomes your parent. I didn't say how to fl- I didn't say how to flip it over though, so it's not entirely oh a spoiler. Oh my god. Oh my god. And okay, I had to flip so yeah, it over. I've been I've been playing that game whoa, and it's whoa, fucking whoa, great. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I was not done. Hey. You have to flip it over like Th- like a bunch of times. Hold it! No, like, stop. Just, We're not just, going in depth on how to beat and spoil all of these bosses. The point is, they want to do it once, and it's impossible. I don't. It's impossible. I don't know how to do that more than. Are you kidding? Less me? than one time. Yeah. You just got to get good at the game. I feel like I'm okay at it, and it seems impossible. It's not. It's when not. I when I, well, I've I've played the game three times now, but when I did it this last time, and I did that Colossus, I flipped it. Mm-hmm. But then I didn't get to it fast enough, and it got back up. And then I flipped it again, and then killed it all while it was flipped that second time. So if as long as I would get to it in time the first time, I would have killed it. In, I all in I one figured flip. out how to get to it immediately when it flips. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah. But had still. I just gotten to it faster, I would have gotten that trophy right off the bat. Yeah. I don't think we just why spoilers is, is a concern for this game though. It's been out for a decade, more than. I a don't decade. know, Holden. Let's fucking spoil it all. It has ties to Eco at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Does it really? 
Shut up. Yes, it's a spoiler. <laughs> I didn't know that, but I can't be upset that I didn't know that because it's been out for 10 years. I had my oh, opportunity. Oh, man. I, so this game, I'm almost done with it again for a third time. I love it a lot. Mm-hmm. It's fucking gorgeous. There are, I've noticed a, t- a couple technical glitches. Like There's some pop-in as you're kind of going. Grass will kind of pop up under your feet, but it's still mm-hmm. fucking gorgeous everywhere. Yeah, I've it's... noticed the motion blur kind of tends to every once in a while for like a frame. I'll see some blurring or some. You can turn that off though. Not uh, not the blur itself, but it artifacts a little bit and it kind of oh, has okay. a little glitch. Yeah, but that's I've only noticed it occasionally, and it's only for I... a frame or two. I haven't noticed anything technically wrong with the game in that respect. Maybe I'm just not looking close enough. The only thing that drives me nuts is the horse is really annoying to control. Oh yeah, I don't understand the controls for it. Like, do you ever have this where it just slows down? Yeah, if it's in, like, a really skinny path or in the woods, then it just straight up won't go anywhere. Very I've fast. even had it, I mean, in the middle of a gigantic field. And yeah, it's it going just, uphill. It's yep. really annoying. Or if there's a ladybug in the path. <laughs> 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 it's gotten a lot better since the PS2 version, but, oh, yeah, I'm it's sure still, it has. Yeah. And that's one of the things about this game. I love it a lot. This is the, the best version of the game. It mm-hmm. The controls are still a pain in the ass to work, but that's part of the game. Part of the struggle I of climbing. I don't find the controls that bad, honestly. Like they're it's not, a little, it's a little floaty at times. It, they're they're not terrible, but it's not definitely as intuitive or easy as like scaling a wall in Assassin's Creed Origins, or literally just holding a button and climbing whatever you want in Zelda. Mm-hmm. But that, as as I uh, as I mentioned, it's kind of part of the game. That struggle. If if they had fixed the controls and made everything so easy to climb, like it was in Zelda, there would be no challenge in the game, and you would beat it really quickly. Yeah, there's there's definitely. Um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to avoid spoilers in this one, but there's a a water colossi that's you you fall off a few times and it's really like frustrating almost, but it just kind of adds the epicness of like running along it. You don't know what I'm talking about. You're gonna go underwater and all that. Yep. How far there are you were, in it? Uh, I'm at the ninth colossi now. Okay. Colossus. So I just made it to the um, ninth colossus singular. Colossus. Colostomy bag. No, so Shadow of the Colossus to me back. I'm at the desert one where it's like, it actually is very similar to the one I just talked about in the water, but it's in sand instead. Oh, it seems like. yes. I like that one a lot. Um, I haven't figured out how to beat him yet. I just you keep haven't? getting on my horse and being like, right, what do I do? And then he just runs into me. So <laughs> I kind of just stop good. playing. Um, but it seems like a, a fun one. Um, cause have you been listening to the people... tips that the man reads to you saying, and it says like, Shoot him in the butt. Oh yeah, I I had I might turn those off actually because I kind of don't like them. Oh okay. Because I kept um Wait. there was the one where he's the really tall guy with the beard. Yes. And um and I like I couldn't I already knew what to do, but I couldn't get to where I needed to get immediately. Yeah. So he kept telling me, and I'm like, I know, like stop it. I, I get I it. No, bro. I, it's it was honestly it wasn't as bad as Navi because at least like, the game didn't stop. <laughs> Listen. What but... do? But yeah, it's just fantastic. It's um, I feel like the um the um all the colossuses are getting better and better as Colossi. they go along. Colossi, shut up. <laughs> um, are getting better and better as it goes along, and I don't know. I'm really enjoying it. Every encounter with one of these bosses, I'm just gonna say bosses, so you don't correct me. Colossi. No, it's a boss this time. <laughs> um, is they just they just feel so epic. They do. And and you kind of think, okay, well, that must have been the most epic one because that one was huge. And then you see the next one, and you're like, okay, that was really epic too. And it just, it just seems to keep topping itself as it goes yep. along. And I'm just worried that, like, the last three are going to feel like he's like, yeah, we just kind of had to put three more in here and just kind of, I don't know. I'm worried yeah. because it just, I'm, it's, I'm it's, really it's so impressed. good right now. It's yeah, so I'm, good. I feel like it can't stay that good and that consistent. I'm impressed by it's a classic. the scale so. and how like epic and huge all of these things are. And the game yes. does a really good job of kind of exaggerating that too. Even the scale mm-hmm. of the world, as you're riding on aggro, it'll kind of zoom out. Yeah. And like you'll be kind of riding off the distance. Or the it'll kind of be a really low camera, so it's emphasizing the sky and the Colossus in it and things like that. It's funny is that I'm playing this because I didn't play it on the PS2. And, I'm, and this is probably one of the best games you could have possibly remastered because – or remade really because it's that sense of scale and epicness is so heightened by the potential of the PS4 versus the PS2. Yeah. And I'm like, did it really achieve the same effect more than 10 years ago? Like that just seems crazy to me because this game today still feels super epic and grand. Like when yeah. you're on the bird, when you're on the bird Colossus and he's just like, you know, flapping his wings and you're dangling around, you can see all the stuff around you. It's all happening. 
it's crazy. Like all, yep. like all the whole landscape around you while you're flying on top of them. It's so, so cool. I like this game a lot. It's a good game. I can't wait to beat it. But I'm taking my time with it because I really want to savor it. Have I'm also you fought... I don't think you have yet. I think number 10. Have you fought a tiny <clears throat> Colossus yet? No. Okay. Those, that's haven't. probably my, my least favorite in the whole game. <laughs> and I think have, that's next for you. Have you... Uh, are you playing on hard mode? No, I'm playing on normal. But I think for the first time, I honestly think that I'm going to go back and do time trials and do hard mode and things like that as well. I'm doing hard mode. It's not that hard. Your mom's not that. Oh, that's probably why you couldn't beat the thing in one pass through. Oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Dumb but bitch. What else have you been playing? That's it? That's it. I told you that at the beginning of the segment. I said that's all I've played, and that was eight minutes and three seconds ago. Holden, <laughs> what else have you played? Well, I played Shadow of the Colossus, of course. and You played Shadow I... of the Colostomy Bag? <laughs> and not that much else, honestly, because I haven't had a lot of time being back in school and all that. But, um... I did um, download a, a mobile game that I enjoy a lot. It was just kind of got this itch to play. No, it's not. And there's only Boost 2. I want there to be a Boost 3. Was it 3. 4s? No, it's Mini Metro. Was I it 4 skins? Have I talked about Mini Metro on this podcast no. before? You have not. Mini Metro is a lot of fun. It's a good iOS game. The idea is it's really simplistic looking. But if you think about any one of those, um, like if, if you're in Chicago, you're in New York, you're in an area with a like, public transportation system, right. and they had those maps of like the different colored lines and all the different... Um, state stops on them the game basically looks like one of those maps and the idea is that you are in a blank map of like san francisco or london or paris and then shapes start to appear like a circle or a triangle or a square and then on the triangle little tiny circles will surround it and those are people wanting to go to the circle stop so you have to draw train lines to connect and get people to where they're going but it starts to get really complex where well, you can't have three train stops that are all circles in a row because then no one's really getting off the train. Mm. So you have to find the best paths. And it starts getting really frustrating when you have a cluster of like 10 circles in one area and you don't know how to you know, most efficiently go through that. Or there might be environmental obstacles like there's a river and you only have a certain number of bridges to get over that river. So to, the woods, to grandmother's house. Exactly. And... You have to manage your resources and how many trains you have. Okay, well, does the red line need more trains than the yellow line? It's really fun. It's a really addictive game. I highly recommend it. It's pretty simple. Like, there's not a lot to it, but Titties. I recommend it. It's, it's What's the name fun. of it again? Yeah. Mini Metro. Mini Metro. I don't no know how relation. much it is. You can't see prices in, in the app store. <laughs> Principal Vagina. No relation. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you check iOS for a second and see, or the iOS app store and see how much it costs? Because I can't, because oh I already bought it. Because you already bought it. it. Bought it, that game. Oh my god, I'm at 20% battery. Sorry, I, was, I went to a lot of places today, and I played Pokemon Go the whole time. Everywhere you go, you play Pokemon Go. Everywhere you go. What am I looking for? Mini Metro. Mini Metro. They have Two Bully words, on one iOS word. now. Bully, yeah, that came out a while ago. Four ninety nine. Build a better subway. Mini Metro. Four ninety nine. really? Yeah. Editor's Choice Award. I feel like I didn't play that, or pay that much for it when I bought it. You buy, probably bought it on sale whenever it was best of 2016. I always love in the app store they say launch price is you know half off, but it's always launch price and it never changes. Dude, it just gets you to want to buy it. Always launching. ABC always be closing. ABL mm -hmm. always be launching. Yeah, so kind of a slow week in terms of what we've been playing, but there's a lot of news to go over. Whoa, how many nudes are there? No um, nudes, because we're a family podcast, motherfucker. <laughs> we are definitely not a family podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So, gee, I don't know where to start with news this week because there's just know, there's a lot of big start. stuff. I, I know where to start. Speaking of it, our game of the month, and by speaking of, I mean this is the first time we're bringing it up today. The Surge. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, this is the second time because we haven't played that this week. Yes. The Surge is our game of the month. Uh, we'll be talking about it on the 27th as we relaunch as our new name. Uh, Surge 2 is coming! Bigger levels, more brutal boss battles. I'm so fucking pumped. So it's coming sometime in 2019 to consoles and PC. Um, yeah, by yeah, consoles, yeah, yeah, yeah. they probably mean PS4 and Xbox One. Right. I Again, can't if you're a fan of the Dark Souls series, this is a, a no-brainer. It's Dark Souls and sci-fi. And I, they, tag, they had that as like their tagline, and I was like, yeah, but so many things say that the Dark Souls of this. But no, this is fucking Dark Souls with sci-fi yeah. stuff. I actually think it does some things better than Dark Souls. It does. I think the the risk reward. Of, well, shut up. We'll talk about this later. We'll yeah. talk about this later. Yeah, I'm very pumped about that. Um, I don't 
really, I'm curious where they can go with a sequel. I'm very curious because this, yeah. it's actually kind of funny. There's a lot of parallels, I think, between the Surge and Demon Souls. Demon Souls was five areas you would explore, and there was a boss at the end of each one. And the Surge, I've not beaten it yet, but I believe it's five areas. The Surge, yes, it's five areas. It's yeah. kind of, I'm curious if they're going to really open it up and Surge 2 is going to have a lot more content. Or they kind of stick to that kind of smaller claustrophobic feel. Because the they say bigger, feel. they say bigger levels, but that doesn't mean like it's going to be open to areas. It just might mean it's a longer tunnel you're going through or something like that. I'm kind of curious how that gets handled because I love the claustrophobic feeling. Of the I'm surge. excited. I'm but excited. We're, we're not going to get too much into it because we don't want to ruin our thoughts on the surge. Hey, the worst I'm going to combine. I'm going to combine two of our news stories here because one of them was added before this second one was added. Yep. Bando Namkai. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Bandai, Bandai Namco, Namco <laughs> is making a Nintendo Switch exclusive FPS. Which they labeled one. as a FPS adventure game. Yes. Which I first heard that and went, hmm, that sounds like Metroid Prime. It has been revealed by sources to Kotaku that, yes, it is actually Metroid Prime. I wouldn't be surprised because Bandai Namco also made the Super Smash Bros. game for wii u did, yeah they have a good history with it they have the super yeah. smash bros great game they did um oh fuck what else something else really recently they just they did a well. star fox game did at they? one point yeah what um, is really promising about this however this is bandai namco bandai yeah i said that right bandai namco singapore which is kind of a new studio made of um people who came from the project Star Wars 1313, which is that single-player action-adventure yeah. game that got canceled a few years ago. That was one that of my most cool upsetting canceled games. Yeah. So that I'm excited that they're awesome. coming to play to make Metroid. Mm-hmm. I'm glad so they are hype. still labeling it as a first-person adventure game. That's a really important element of the Metroid Prime series. So I'm glad they're kind of... It sounds like they really just want to recapture that again. Yeah. As opposed yeah. to like doing another M, which is, we're going to do something crazy. We're going to give Sam as this amazing backstory. And I'm like, I don't care. Just give me a Metroid game. Apparently just give me a standard Metroid game. Did you ever play other M? No, I avoided it, but because I, I heard what it was it. like, and I saw was like that cutscenes Wii or from that it. Wii? it was Wii. It was also okay. strange too, because you held the Wii mote like an NES controller. Oh yeah. Cause it was, it was like, very strange. It was like two and a half dimensions, right? Yeah. It was, they called, it was like a 2.5 D, but it still looked like a that's, 3d that's game. The same thing. And then, well, no, so the difference is that a 2.5D game is where you have, like, okay, uh, the Mega Man 11. I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm just saying, I said two and a half dimensions, and then you said, yeah, it's like a 2.5D game. And I was like, oh, that's exactly, exactly what I said, okay. just abbreviated. I mean, we just talked over each other there. Um, but it, it still has a 3D environment. It's strange. There's this whole weird thing where you would point the Wiimote at the TV to go into a first person, and that's the only way you could shoot missiles. And it just, I don't know, it just seems like a really overly convoluted uh control scheme but yeah i'm excited for this. this is probably my most anticipated game outside of last of us part two gotcha yeah cannot last wait part two so pumped mm-hmm. hey read me a story um i want to jump to one that's really exciting for me i'm gonna delete okay. those two stories Ooh, um, i already did delete them oh okay well, i'm deleting them again then uh keeping on the nintendo train nintendo switches on uh, online's next announcement will be worth the wait did you see this one yeah this was one of those like stupid like of course you're gonna fucking tease an announcement of an online service of mm-hmm. course you're gonna release something like why why is this even news well i think the, the bigger part of this is that it means that something is coming soon their next announcement on it i i'm implying this is going to be relatively soon uh that we're gonna hear about this not like within a month or anything like that but i'm thinking they might do another direct before e3 and they might talk about it there okay and and the way they're talking about it, it seems like they want to do something different than what the other services are doing. I get the impression that it's not going to just be connecting with your friends online. There's going to be something new to it that we probably haven't seen before. And yeah. that's what I'm most excited about. There was actually an investor call that uh, GameSpot did an interview with about uh, – damn it. I, I thought I had this in here. There was an investor call, and it, they did a bunch of – articles on GameSpot coming from that and one of them was that it will be a very product focused online service yeah as opposed to like only like this is the way you pay to play online with friends Mm -hmm. so there's going to be definitely a product element of it whether that's like their rumored Netflix style virtual console or whether it's going to be like the free game PS Plus kind of stuff or I I think they're just knowing what they have in their arsenal, I think their best thing to do would be, hey, we're going to give you a... Every month, we're going to have a different collection of games that you can play 
from our virtual console back catalog. And after the month, they're gone or something like that. Kind of like how Netflix kind of cycles through yeah. some games. Even it's Xbox good to hear Game from Pass them. cycles, yeah. Yeah, it's good to hear from them, though, confirmation that, yeah, this will be much more than just pay-to-play online. Because, yeah. I mean, honestly, if, if I'm going to pay-to-play online Mario Kart that I can already pay nothing to play online on a Wii U, I'm mm-hmm. not going to pay to do that on the Switch. Although I probably would, so shut up. Well, it's also going to be 20 bucks a year. Yeah, so it's not going to be too... It's going to be well, literally a, a third of the price of competitors. Bank breaker. So that's all good stuff. I want to um, stick with one last Switch thing. Yeah. Uh, you can officially now pay with gold points that you earn for Nintendo. Well, not now, but you will be able to in March. Pay using your gold points that you get from buying things digitally or mm-hmm. physically. For a long time. So this launched with the new My Nintendo back when Tomo launched on iOS a couple years ago. And since then, you've only been able to exchange these coins for like a 30% discount off of some game you don't want on 3DS or a theme on Wii U. So it's cool that these are now being able to be exchanged for actual games or money on Switch. Which is well, cool. I have a ton of those gold points, I, but I'm not sure if they've expired yet or not. So I should check in on that. So they do expire a year after you get them. Yeah, they're definitely... Actually, in that case, everything I've got on Switch... This hasn't been out a year yet. I should have a lot of gold, so... Well, hopefully I they see. won't expire before this launches, because it launches in March. Switch came out at the beginning of March. No, I actually... So funny, I think most of the games that I bought have actually been... Were actually a few months after launch. I really Good. only had Zelda Oh, because you have Mario. Zelda on cartridge, right? Yeah, Zelda on cartridge, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have, I have 300 gold coins from the many games that I've downloaded. I haven't checked. I probably... Coins... Have... I have more than you then because I have a lot more stuff. Than oh, yeah, you have a lot you. more stuff that you've bought. But of, I've bought Mario, Mario Kart, Zelda, Celeste, um, Mario Rabbids. Mm-hmm. So I have all of those. I have 300 gold coins. I don't know whether that's because some expired or not, but I don't I have all of those. And based on the exchange rate, they've only announced that one yen equals one gold coin. And based that on the exchange rate right us. now, that's about one cent per gold coin. So about $3. Oh, that's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, it's it's, it's more than nothing. But... It's more than nothing, yeah. But that's kind of that's super cheap. <laughs> yeah, it's three dollars off of the game. That's free money, though. That's cool. So you have to, that if it's sixty bucks, then you'd have to buy six thousand. You have to have six thousand points to get a whole game for free. Yeah, that's some bullshit right there. That's it's funny. Okay. It's free. They didn't like, have to. No, do this one, at all. no one goes they like. Could have, punch, they could have here's... continued to give us stupid themes. Totally, but it's like you go to like a punch card thing. You're like, oh, on your like your tenth burrito, you get a, a half off your next burrito. It's so go on your six thousandth burrito, you get half <laughs> off of you get a free burrito. That's not compelling. Um, okay, so this is a story I think is pretty big, and it's a rumor. It's not really being reported as a rumor in a lot of cases, but I think this is a big deal. And this is go, Google's go, go. Yeti service. Oh yeah, oh, which is kind yeah. of two parts. Is that there's not a lot of confirmed stuff. Actually, well, nothing's been confirmed, but there's still some debate on what the details of this are. But Yeti service is essentially a game streaming service that's going to be launched by Google. Yep. And to accompany that, they're going to do this through Chromecast, but they're apparently going to have their own streaming box available for Google. There has also been talk of like a console console, but I don't believe that one as much. I think if Google's getting into this, they're going to do something really unique that no one else is doing, and that would yeah. be a little box that streams games. Yeah. I mean, their whole company is, is streaming focused, whether it's exactly. Google docs or Chromecast. Or well, it's like all that. web-based. It's all, yeah. It's all web-based. Yeah. If there's any company I think can really nail online game streaming, they have the, the know-how on the cloud and how the cloud operates. I mean, so much of the internet runs off of Google anyway. Yeah. Now so we'll I, actually see if it's like a legit platform that people support or whether it's more like a yes. new uh, you can download Android apps to it. Than I have place. the feeling that it's going to basically be you can stream <clears throat> PC games. It's going to be kind of like that. Yeah, like the NVIDIA Shield kind of thing. Yeah, I get that that feeling from, um, from it. Not not like you have to have a PC in your home, but no, whatever's like available on PC. NVIDIA virtual PC. Yeah, kind of like that, exactly. So I think it might be like that, and I think that's actually a good way to go about it because they can get a lot of games that way without yeah. having to like, pay third parties and that kind of stuff. But they're going to need exclusives if they really want this to stand out. Exclusive. <laughs> but it's got to, if, if this is the only way you can play to streaming, it has to be flawless. And I think how Google might handle this is using a lot of their AI efforts. Where they, I, 
AI efforts where they can kind of be predictive. And I wonder if we're gonna do something where <clears throat> they reduce lag by predicting what your input's gonna be. Mm. And I don't know how you feel about that. If that's mm. that's just you know, total that, speculation, but I think I remember I remember something about that, like similar kind of stuff they do with Gaikai and PlayStation Now mm. and on live used to do that as well. Like I don't think that's uncommon for them to like predict, all right, if he pushes this button at this time, let's already have that ready to go just in case. Yeah. I think that's not uncommon. And that would, and they could, and AI um, block Google's AI algorithms would be able to detect. Okay, this is the way you play. They'll personalize it in some way, so yeah. they can make even better predictions based on you know your Google profile or whatever. Who knows? And you know, Haley Joel Osment has grown up a lot, and he's become a much smarter person. So it's definitely <laughs> something he could do. Get it? AI Steven Spielberg. Oh, okay. I'm like, Haley what are you Joel talking Osment? about? He's um, much fatter though. He has a yeah, he, he did put on uh, weight. What was, was he just? What was he just in recently? Uh, was it Kingsman? Uh, I don't not remember. Kingsman. No, he's in a show called the Hulu show called uh, Future Man. Ooh, he's in that. He was in <laughs> one of the funniest things I've ever watched. This show called Spoils of Babylon. It's a Will Ferrell. Oh, I've heard about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kristen Wiig. What's his face? Spider Man, Tobey Maguire. All it's fucking hysterical. Anyways, so, going back to Google though, would you get yeah. a Google console if it came out? No, no, no. I would. What if not. it's like a hundred dollars? No, I would not. Why not? I've got a PS4 and Xbox One, a Switch, and also have an allegiance to Apple. So, oh, gotcha. So if Apple came out with one, you'd you'd get it. I mean, probably everything else I have in my entire house is Apple. <laughs> um, I don't know. I can, it depends on what it is. I would consider it. It's an interesting idea. I wonder how they would handle um, the portability with it. I think that'd be interesting because if it's yeah. streaming, this can kind of be everywhere. And I actually have a, a grand theory about streaming games in the future, but I will talk about that in our Switch episode coming up. We Ooh. count the year for the Switch. I have a crazy prediction about all that. Um, it's not what you think it is, <laughs> but you're – all right, you're making weird noises. Let's move on. <laughs> no, I'm not. That's totally normal adult noises. <laughs> Um, kingdom not kingdom that's not what i wanted to read i want to read this one instead sea of thieves <laughs> will add microtransactions around three months in i think this answers a lot of questions of how does microsoft make money when they release everything on games pass day one i yeah i think also part of it too is well geez ea really got shit on for having microtransactions in battlefront 2 let's have a built-in audience and then charge the money this is very different than Battlefront 2. Battlefront 2 I know, was I know it loot is. boxes, randomized, tied to progression, and play to win. Or pay no, to win. I know, but what I'm saying, though, is, is that there's such a, a stigma against loot boxes right now, that, or microtransactions, really, in general, that talking about it before the game's out can kind of sour some people away from your game. But if they're not there initially, you can get an audience to play the game, and then when they like it, you're more willing to buy a microtransaction. Well, these are very, very different microtransactions, mm -hmm. and they are purposefully built. They're not loot boxes. They're not pay to win. They are purely cosmetic. Sure, yeah. They can be things you can get through the game. They might be. They're said they're not. They don't have anything finalized right now, but they could be like you drink a potion to make your character look super old for a, a limited time, <laughs> and things like that. So really fun, cute, cosmetic. They call them emotional changes. You might be able to oh. – you can have, like – they're wanting to do pets of some sort. Like, you can have mm -hmm. a cat that's on the ship, or you can have a monkey that sits on your shoulder. Mm -hmm. or like, maybe you can pay to get a different kind of pet earlier or something like that. So they're all cosmetic and emotional changes, microtransactions, rather than anything that affects the game, which is really cool. Yeah, I'm – that's the kind of the microtransactions I'm okay with. And I actually think it's kind of smart to do it not at launch but after launch. Yep. Like that, because I mean, just what I said earlier about getting your audience to play the game and then start giving them that kind of stuff. It also means that the people who play the game up to three months after launch are people who really love that game, and then you're exactly. giving them more to to do with that game afterwards. And you they're let the ones that are saying, yeah. you know, I've already played this game for three months. I really enjoyed it. I didn't pay much for it. Of course, yeah, yeah I'll throw a couple bucks your way. Mm -hmm. Plus, also when you're that into it and you go, oh, I can be a pirate with a with a parrot on my shoulder. Uh, yeah, I really want to do that. I yep. love this game. So I think this is a smart way of doing it. Yep. And of course. I'm not. A, I'm never going to say I love microtransactions, but cosmetic is the way to do it. Definitely. Absolutely. I think it's funny though. The getting old, drink a potion yeah. to make yourself really old. That's so random. <laughs> there are things I've done, like in uh, Guild Wars. Occasionally, you could you, like drink a potion to make your head turn into a pumpkin on Halloween and things like that while you play mm -hmm. the game. So you're just this guy with a pumpkin head fighting a bunch of shit. Mm -hmm. Speaking of additions to the game, 
You added a story in here that I'm curious about. MLB, the show, adds rain delays. Yes. In a step to getting more and more realistic, games are now... MLB The Show 18 is adding rain delays to your baseball games. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get this right. So I, don't, I didn't read the story. I'm really basing this off of you. But does that mean like, oh, I'm going to go play MLB The Show. Oh, I can't. It's raining in the game. Like, so, what does that mean in terms of gameplay? That sounds horrible. So they haven't really like released the a lot of details. <laughs> they haven't released a lot of details on it. Assumptions are that it won't be like you're playing and then inning three, it starts raining. And you're like, well, fuck, you have to take a six hour break while the rain clears. But instead, it'll be like, here's a rain delay. This is now a strategic opportunity. Do you keep your pitcher in and try to keep him his oh, arm warm for six hours? That's clever. Or do you use this as an opportunity to warm up a new pitcher with a fresh arm when the rain delay is over? So it's more of a strategic element in there as well. But I thought that was really interesting that like we're just now getting so realistic that we're now adding inconveniences to your game. Well, no, I laughed. I laughed so hard at that because the first thing I thought of was, oh, it's like when you go to climb a mountain in Breath of the Wild, you're halfway up and it starts raining and then you just have to stand there. Yeah, that's wait a for the shitty rain implementation of rain. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's hysterical, actually. That's very clever. Read me something else. Read me. Read me. So this is, read a, me. this is a rumor here that I think is absolutely true. And this is Spyro Trilogy Remastered coming to PS4 this year. Oh, this has been confirmed by multiple sources to Kotaku. Yeah, and beyond that... It has not been announced. It has not been announced, yeah. It is, apparently, yeah. it's beginning announced next month. It'll come out in like uh, July to September this year. Right. But um, it's... With Crash and how well it did last year. I mean, that it's was a the no top... Brainer. It's a no-brainer. Like, why yeah. wouldn't they do this? It's going to cost them next to nothing. And I, personally, I've never played a Spyro game before. I'd be okay. more interested in Spyro than I would in Crash Bandicoot. Yeah, they're okay. I don't know why. But yeah, Vicarious Visions is is what is reported, is the studio reportedly making these, which is the same one that did the Insane trilogy. Mm-hmm. It is just kind of like Crash Bandicoot. Exclusive question mark to PS4. Could possibly come to other things, but no one's saying anything. Um, Crash Bandicoot will come to other consoles because it's not owned by Sony anymore. Right, but I mean like, you would think they would say that. It's almost been a year now that it's been out, and they haven't even announced that it's coming to it, the it's gonna It's going to be a big announcement at E3. By the way, guys, love Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. Well, we have a new game we're making, and it's coming to Xbox One. Blah, and people go crazy. Um, Nude game. So there's <laughs> apparently, what was it? The um, Where was this mentioned? There's something in the article where they mentioned bringing in other games as well. And they mentioned, like, oh, it's not in this article. I was reading somewhere that someone had this like, list of, oh, other games like to see remastered from these companies. And they included Ratchet and Clank. And I'm like, they did that already. They did that on PS4, and it was amazing. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, that game doesn't get a lot of credit. It kind of started that trend of, of this generation, at least, of completely remaking the game and not just up it. Right. Ratchet and Clank was completely remade from the ground up for PS4. And it's awesome. It's so good. It's actually— It looks gorgeous. That's oh, it's a so game gorgeous. that I think I want to download and play on my OLED TV. It is— so worth it. It's also just a total blast to play. That game I just is. I want to inject that straight into my eyes. Very underrated. I want them to do it with another one of those games too, because that was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the Spyro thing is absolutely going to happen. I'd be shocked if it didn't happen. It makes too much sense. Yeah. I'd also hey, do you give a shit about Kingdom Hearts? Do you give a shit about Kingdom Hearts? I, I, I know I've asked you this a hundred times, but I don't give a shit enough to remember your response. Um, I've only played the um, the classic. I mean, the the considered the best in the series, Birth by Sleep on PSP. Right, right. So, okay. no, not a huge Kingdom I've Hearts I've only fan. played the first, like, 15 minutes of number one, and that was it. But they have Monsters, Inc. World confirmed. They showed it off, a couple mm-hmm. of cool things. They, I mean, it doesn't... What's weird is that I feel like this game has been in development so long, and they've been working on it so long, that now their stuff is starting to look old. Kind of like the Fallout 4. They yeah. were working on it forever, and they released it, mm-hmm. and it was like, oh, well, now things look better than when you guys started working on that. I mean, it looks like, obviously Sully's better. Like, does not look that good? It doesn't. It's, all, it's obviously a lot better looking than the PS2 versions sure, of those yeah. games. So it, it's technically a step up in a big way. But, yeah, I haven't seen – and this is just, I think, from our points of view. There are people who are super excited about this game. I'm sure, yeah. I'm not that pumped for this. I'm really kind of skeptical. Yeah, I mean, I won't play it at all. I really want to play Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2. I actually did enjoy Birth by Sleep. And I think that beca- if I had played 1 and 2, I probably wouldn't have liked Birth by Sleep because I hear it's not up to the same caliber. But gotcha. I enjoyed it. I wouldn't mind trying it out. But I'm also not a big fan of the you know, Final Fantasy, really long, epic RPGs. And that's what this game is. So, I don't know. 
cool. kind of I want to try it. I don't want to try it. I don't know. Speaking of things warm. I do kind of really, really want to try, Monster Hunter World. Mon- I just said Monster Hunter World. Monster Hunter World is now the fastest selling game in Capcom history. That beats out Good all Marvel vs. Capcoms. That beats out Mega Man. That beats out all Resident Evils. Good for fucking them. Mm hmm. I'm curious where it sold the most, though. I bet it still sold the most in Japan. Probably, yeah. Five I, million copies shipped in three days following its launch, and now I think it's that's like six really million solid. sold. Uh, units ship have reached the six million mark, so it's shipped again. But that means there's demand for it. Fucking and good selling. for them, man. Good for them. Do you? So you still really want to play this game? I do. I kind of hate that I've already missed the opportunity to get the Watcher Cat. I forget what they the pa, Palico Calico Cat. Pal- I have no idea what you're talking about, but sure. The yeah. cat companion that you have in the game. You know how they announced, like, you can have Mega Man as your cat companion instead. Or you could oh. also have a Watcher from Horizon Zero Dawn, but you had to oh, do a special quest. Oh, that's right, that's that right, that's last right. Week. Yeah. yeah. You failed. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Hawaii wants to fight the predatory behavior of loot boxes. They are releasing legislation to limit loot boxes. I don't know how I feel about that, because loot boxes are not great, but... It kind of ties into that assumption that it's predatory, and I think that Apple has the best solution to this, which is you have to show the the um, the ratios or the the odds of just you getting clear, what you that's want. It's not an Apple decision. That's something that's been going on in China and Korea for a long time. Oh, so they're just adopting that? Yeah. Well, um, that's the approach to do it. Go on to that's that's what they're looking for. I haven't read this article. What is it that Hawaii wants to do? So I'll read this. Um, I'll read the portion. Portion sizes in America are too big. Did you guys miss that water pour? <laughs> Should we keep that as part of the new podcast? So it doesn't say, but I'll read the kind of the highlighted portion that the um, the Verge has here. These kinds of loot boxes and microtransactions are explicitly designed to prey upon and exploit human psychology in the same way casino games are so designed. This is especially true of young adults who child psychologists and other experts explain are particularly vulnerable. These exploitive mechanisms and the deceptive marketing promoting them have no place in games uh, being marketed to minors and perhaps no place in games at all. So they basically want to try to get rid of it, but they haven't. It's only been proposed legislation. Nothing's been set in stone, so there's nothing really, this is the thing that we're doing. They're just kind of talking like, we want to get rid of this. It's never going to happen. It's never going to fly. Yeah, it's it's always kind of awkward whenever the government tries to step in and, and legislate games because govern, government they have no people, idea what they're talking about. Exactly, they don't yeah. they don't understand gaming or gaming culture or gaming mechanics, which is why ESRB stepped up and said, like when people were complaining about, mm-hmm. oh my, my kid is playing this game with blood in it. Like, hey, 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 wait, we'll make sure that every game is good. You guys don't step in. We'll make sure we have a rating system so that the government has. And to it's actually it's everything. been really successful. Yeah. ESRB. Yeah. I don't. I don't hear any complaints about so ESRB. So that's what I would. I think a better solution, rather than like governments coming in and saying like we make loot boxes out of like get them out of our games. I think yeah. it's better that something like the ESRB steps in and says, "Hey, let's talk about a more like constructive solution that us in the gaming mm-hmm. community understand and can get behind." Yeah, I mean, I understand the business necessity to have something like loot boxes, and so I don't think they're going to go away. But something needs to be done for sure. Yeah. Like I think that the I think that the general rule we've already talked about this a million times. The general rule is, as we just said, cosmetic, nothing progression based. I think that's like yep. rule number one. Yep. Rule number two should be showing the odds of what you're gonna get. If you do have a loot boxes. I think that's really important. And I would say rule number three is everything you can get in a loot box, you can get in the game somehow. Yeah, I like that idea too. Um, I, like I think those are like three common sense things you could do to really help with loot boxes. But just wanted to point that one out there. Boop. Two more stories. What else you want to talk about, Chad? I want to do the Assassin's Creed one. I'm in yeah. favor of this. Assassin's Creed. Ubisoft. This comes from IGN. Ubisoft concentrating on origins rather than a new entry in the once annual franchise. So Ubisoft on an earnings call, there was a question about whether or not we'd be seeing a new Assassin's Creed this year, and they're uh, Ubisoft CEO Yves Guillemot said, quote, we are concentrating at the moment on AC hyper, uh, 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 colon O, for which we are going to launch a few other DLCs. So you will be amazed by what will come on AC 
colon O. It's yeah, they had, Origins. They had mentioned that they want the Egyptian setting to feel like a living, breathing world. And I think like yep. by kind of adding to it and you know making it dynamic, yep. they're gonna they're gonna achieve that. And I think that's I think it's a better trend is rather than releasing a brand new game every single year for any franchise, not just yep. Assassin's Creed, release it and then just support it for a while. And, and there are like, a couple of things they've learned too that they they said we're gonna keep making Assassin's Creed games every year as long as you keep buying them. They saw a mm-hmm. dip and then they said, cool. We're going to take a year, and if that means that there's another year between Assassin's Creed and the next Far Cry, then great. Fuck it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. So they've seen that. Give it a little more time. And then they've also seen success with things like Rainbow Six Siege Mm -hmm. and like that ongoing, almost like game of service type model. So, of course, they're going to adopt a little bit of that in Assassin's Creed. That's awesome. It also makes more sense with Assassin's Creed 2, I think, because each game is, is centered around a new setting. And you can do so much more with these settings given time, but if you have to move on to the next thing, you're really letting down the experience you just released. Yep. And that's one thing that you really have to give credit for in Assassin's Creed game is they're all really well-designed worlds. They're all very cool settings. So cool. So cool. I think the weakest one was, oddly enough, one I was most excited about, which was um, Revolutionary, Revolutionary War times. Bring like Assassin's Creed 3? Assassin's Creed 3, yeah. That's the only one I thought but was But you had a Tomahawk! Weak. That was cool, but you also were climbing buildings that were a single story high, and that wasn't very fun. Yeah. It's like when you go from the towering cathedrals to, like, a house, it's not as not as interesting. Yeah, yeah. But still very cool. Hey, read this last story. Um, I don't know anything about the story because okay, you I'll put tell it you. in here. So Fortnite officially has more concurrent players on PUBG or than PUBG on Steam. So PUBG... Like six months ago, we were talking about, wow, this is crazy. It's it's passing Dota and League of Legends and things like that on all these concurrent players lists. And now Fortnite, who stole its thunder and it even tried to sue, is <laughs> saying, hey, by the way, we're going to eat your lunch. Well, we I think this, players. Is, this is what PUBG was scared of. Yep. They, were, they, they basically wanted to be the only place you could have this kind of experience. I don't think they realized they just made a new form of multiplayer that's applicable to just about any multiplayer game. Exactly, and Fortnite has a lot more polish on it than PUBG does. So. And that's the biggest problem is I think they – what have they been doing? They've had so much money. I don't understand – like, it just is it badly coded? Like, what Trying is Trying to the, keep the servers up, I guess. I don't know. Well, they have Microsoft servers now, which has got to be a huge step yeah. up for them. There's also a difference in Fortnite's been in development for literally a decade versus PUBG's been in development for, like, a year and a half, two years. That's true. That's a good point. So that million – that – Account was Fortnite hit 3.4 million concurrence on Sunday, February 4th. That's 3.4 million people at the same time playing one game. That's the whole population of Chicago all playing Fortnite at the same time. <laughs> Actually, all the people are in Chicago. That's how it is. That's exactly how it is. Fortnite yep. doesn't exist outside of Chicago. No, nope, not at all. Oh, man, that's the end of the news. No more news stories. Don't worry. We've got a cool-ass topic today. This is a topic I'm very excited about. Happy birthday. To you. It's PS Vita. Happy birthday, Mr. President. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the PlayStation Vita, which is a topic. The PlayStation Vita. I've wanted to talk about this since we started doing this podcast. And it's, I think, a very underrated system for some things and very screwed up in other ways. But, yeah. you know, you look at all these consoles that haven't done well. And I think this is... In terms of being a good system, this is the best of the consoles that have failed. Yeah. Virtual Boy, that was abysmal. I understand why the Wii U didn't sell. It was confusing and messy. But the Vita was great, and it didn't, just didn't stand up over time, which is a shame. So we're going to kind of break that down, like what we liked about the Vita, what we didn't like about the Vita, what Sony could have done differently. But I want to I stay positive for right now. Yeah. You want to go over a, like a brief history real quick? Yeah. Do you have a history you want to share? Uh, I like perused the Wikipedia page. Um, hold on. Hold I have sales horses. data too. I want to talk about too. Nice, nice, nice. So it basically was announced. Do you remember when it, what it was called originally? NGP Next NGP. Generation Portable. Next Generation Portable. That was announced at like a, a a Sony press conference. It was cool too because under the screen where it says Vita now, it just said PlayStation. I thought that was awesome. Yeah, it was very cool. So yeah, the original one was uh, it was released in 2011 in Japan. December 17th in Japan and then mm-hmm. the next year two months later February 22nd 2012 mm-hmm. in North America and Europe I think that's kind of 
that might be the last thing we saw that shipped like Nintendo or uh, yeah. sorry, the uh, Japan based company. They shipped it in Japan first because PS4 was definitely North America first and Japan mm-hmm. had to wait for it. Yep. And Switch was just worldwide. What's, so what's interesting about the PS Vita launch, and this is one of my favorite gaming memories, is they had two versions released. They had a Wi-Fi and they had a Wi-Fi 3G. 249 yeah. for, for Wi-Fi, 3G was 50 bucks more. And they said if you pre-ordered the 3G version, you could get it February 15th, the whole week earlier. Yep. And I got the 3G version just so I can get it a week earlier. Never turned on the 3G, never activated it ever. I Dumb. only wanted to so get it a week early. And I got it with uh, Uncharted Golden Abyss. Which is, it had a great launch lineup. It did. So they, they, they marketed this thing basically as a, a premium piece of hardware mm-hmm. that when they first announced it, they're like, this is going to be PlayStation 3 quality experiences on the go. It had and a quad-core fact, you know, uh, chip on it, which was huge for the time. Like Phones didn't have quad-core yeah. chips yet. It was a yeah. beast. They even showed off like parts of Metal Gear Solid 4 Guns of the Patriots That's right. playing on this thing. That never happened. Um, uh, actually, they, that, oh, never no, happened. that never happened. That, that never, never happened. happened. No. Yeah. So but they did have the HD collection, at least. They did, yeah. There was a, an engineer or somebody like that that worked in Sony that later came out before it, before it launched. It said, mm-hmm. hey, by the way, you won't be able to play PS3 games on this because it'll fucking suck the battery in five minutes and it will explode in your pocket. <laughs> but it, it ended up following, falling hardware-wise like in between the PSP and PS3. It was kind of a nice mm-hmm. happy medium between the two. Well, it's just kind of what PSP was. It was kind of between um, the uh, PS1 and PS2. It wasn't yeah. quite PS2, but it was definitely... A jump up from PS1. Yeah. So they launched it. It has a bunch of kind of new input methods. It has the touchscreen on the front at a time when touchscreens were only really on smartphones for like mm-hmm. a, a couple of years at that point. Yeah. They had the touchscreen on the back. But it was a dual analog stick, which is a first for any handheld console. And that's what everyone was clamoring for. And they were so disappointed when the PSP Go was released that it didn't have a second analog stick. So mm-hmm. they, yeah, everyone's like, we want a proper dual stick, dual analog stick shooter setup. So they did it. It had two analog sticks. It had a D-pad. It had f- uh, four buttons, the triangle, circle, cross, and square. Left and a right, no triggers, but they had the touchpad and some things that kind of made some some trade-offs there in order for that to work. But it was a yeah. really – it was a, a kind of a marvel in, in, um, in design. It was Absolutely. a beautiful system. It that also had OLED screen on it, I was going to say the OLED screen, which they actually got rid of. It was a 5-inch screen. They got rid of the OLED for the second generation of it, right. but it was, that screen was gorgeous. That was a really, really nice-looking screen. And it was huge, especially compared to something like the 3DS. Oh, yeah. That 5-inch screen, it was even bigger than any smartphone at the time, too. Mm-hmm. I also liked its interface. It had these little, like, bubble icons. Yeah, I wasn't a huge fan of that. but I loved oh, that. Well. I liked it. It was great. So they released it. It had an amazing launch lineup, including Uncharted Golden Abyss. Which, which was one of the best games on it. And I know you're going to kill, kill me for saying this, but because I'm not a huge Uncharted fan for the original I know, three. I just played all the rest of them like two years ago for the first time. <laughs> and uh, I think this is the second best Uncharted game. I think it's Uncharted uh, Thieves' End and then Golden Abyss. I wow, love okay. Golden Abyss. We're going to move on so I don't murder you. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit later about like favorite games and things like that. But it launched. Yeah. It had two models. The 3G model, oddly enough, you couldn't play online with it. It was really only for web browsing or and like asynchronous. transferring sa- uh, saves. Yeah. So but there also, were there was some like multiplayer stuff too. There was quote unquote multiplayer elements where like you could find a friend's high score on the three G network and try to compete against that. Right. Like it, you weren't ever competing directly with that person. But there was they they try to push that as you know you can do online gaming on the three G and I'm like no nah, that's not the same thing. Right. But so they really try extra, to push for that. Extra fifty bucks. <laughs> plus your monthly bill with AT and T. It was on. It was off contract though. You didn't have to do it. Yeah, but it was it was a gorgeous system. It didn't sell too well. Yeah, so I have the sales number on that. If you want to, uh, yeah, lifetime. Go to. for it. So lifetime, it sold about fifteen million units. And actually, looking at the numbers here, it didn't do as badly year on year as you would have thought. Yeah. Um. Most, I mean, it definitely declined, but it stayed pretty consistent. Its first year, if you don't count um, Japan um, launching in November of 2011, in 2012, they sold 3.6 million units, and it only really went down by like less, about 10% each year, which isn't actually terrible. In some cases, it's less than 10%. So, yeah. like, you have 3.6 million, then 3.4 million, 2.8, 2.6, uh, 2 million. So, and then the last year it was 
737,000 units. It really dropped off in 2017, but it was always selling consistently, like on average about two and a half million units per year. And these are, these are never like actually direct, these are estimated numbers because Sony stopped divulging that information Mm -hmm. a couple years into its life cycle. Yeah. But if, from what we have, it's kind of the best that we got. So it actually didn't do, like, there was definitely a interest there. It just wasn't a huge group. It was definitely a niche yeah. interest. But it and didn't... Just, just like the uh, the Switch, however, once people got their hands on it, they bought games like crazy. So it's a, Absolutely. an incredible attach rate. Well, there was also indie games was huge on, on Vita. Because indie developers would put their games there because people would buy their games. Like Spelunky was a PC game, but I still think it was extremely successful on the Vita. Yeah, and remember, that's kind of where Sony's focus shifts when yeah. they realize in 2013. So this is two years after it launches. Um, Shuhei Yoshida says they're going to be releasing fewer first-party games on the platform, and instead they're kind of devoting more of their research and money mm-hmm. into helping indies make their way onto the platform because they yeah. saw a huge boon there for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, unfortunately, by E3 of 2015, four years in, Sony said it would not be making any more AAA titles. And then by October, yep. just a couple months later, they said, no, we're not making any more games for it at all. However, yeah. third parties are still supporting it. Even to this day, there are still games coming out that are cross-buy mm-hmm. uh, and cross-save. And actually, that's one of my favorite things that it did do is it introduced the concept of cross-buy, cross-save, mm-hmm. and cross-play as well, yep. which was really cool. And, well, in regards to kind of what the Switch did with the same kind of game everywhere you went, in terms of indie games, you really did get that experience. Like if you were play, right. played Fez... I play Fez on my Vita, and now that I have, I mean, I don't have a PS4 at the time, but I could have, you know, had the same save across both those systems. No matter where I went, I still had my Fez save. Right. So that was... You, you buy flour in one spot, you have it in all of them, you have the same save mm-hmm. that transfers back and forth. Yep. It that also, was one of my favorite things that it did. Yeah. But also, you use it, we use it a lot. Um, You play Bloodborne together, you come over to my house. Yeah. And... You'd be playing Bloodborne on your Vita through remote play, and remote I'd be playing play, on the TV, yeah. and it worked surprisingly well, actually. This is one of the things that it kind of gets caught in between the two. So it, it first launched before PS4 was even announced it was a thing, mm-hmm. and it had some limited functionality with the PlayStation 3. In fact, you could download Vita games to your PS3 and then transfer them with a USB mm-hmm. cable. Yep. It could do remote play just like PSP could of a couple things on PS3. It, you could watch a movie through it. You mm-hmm. could play a PlayStation 1 classic through it. Mm-hmm. But you couldn't actually remote play PS3 games. I think there were a handful that you could, but it was not a very, very long very, list. Very, very, very yeah. few. And they were all um, Sony like made games. Right. And then busy... PlayStation 4 launches, and they're like, every single game has remote play. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like tailor-made for it. It's like, that's amazing. And for a lot of games, it works incredibly well. And depending on your network setup, it, yeah. yeah, I could go to your house, load up Bloodborne on my Vita, and play right next to you, and... And I was just surprised how chance. well that worked, considering you have an internet connection happening with your Vita to the PS4, and then just yeah. online play to begin with. Yeah, like the fact that that works as well as it does is actually pretty remarkable. Yeah, there's a lot happening there. Um, so I think from here, yeah, we kind of see where it goes. Sony stops supporting it. Indies kind of take over. Becomes yeah. a really great JRPG machine. Indie games. Mm-hmm. What are some of your favorite things about the Vita? Some of your favorite, not not games that did like well that did well, not games, but yeah, things that you things about it that you enjoyed. Um, it's hard to talk about that without talking about the games specifically, but I don't. It was the first time that so I was always a handheld gamer growing up, and I was I always heard this. Uh, it's like a console game on the go. Like our system can do like console game on the go. I kept hearing that all the time, and it yeah, it never really happened. I think this is the fir- the closest they had anyone had gotten at that point, where it really did feel like I was playing something a little bit bigger, a little bit grander. Yeah, on and there. they were literally porting console games to it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you had an HD collection, Metal Metal Gear, un- Metal. I almost said Metal Gear Unsolid, Metal Gear Unsolid. Sol- Unsolid. I don't know what that means. Um, they had that game on on Vita. Like it was the you know two console games. It yeah. was uh, for the it's um Snake Eater. What's the other one? Snake Eater uh, and Sons of Liberty. Sons of Liberty, that's right. Um, that was huge. Like it, finally, it felt like the first time that promise was actually being lived up to. Yeah. And then they even went so far, like they had ported a bunch of PS2 games mm-hmm. that got a war, but then they actually did like Borderlands 2 
which was at the time a current gen game ps3 yeah. 360 is mm-hmm. now running in full on your vita which is crazy absolutely i like the interface a lot which i've already kind of mentioned i really liked that back touchpad but i'm going to talk about that when i talk about games and yeah because there are some really clever things that I saw with that touchpad, and it seemed like a really terrible gimmicky thing. And a lot of games used it really terribly and gimmicky, of course. Sure. But um, they use it like in place of a trigger. You attach on the pad. It's like shut up, get out yeah, of here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't know. Like it was also the first time that I was buying games on the system itself, like that. Because I didn't have a sure. PlayStation. I didn't have. This is kind of my very first like download game experience. Gotcha on a system i know playstation 3 could already do that i know the psp could have already done that this was my first experience with that yeah. and it was very cool i remember i got the biggest game card i could possibly get reasonably priced because those things were <laughs> absurdly expensive yeah uh, we'll i'm sure we'll talk about that yeah. and I don't know, it was the first time i had that all digital game library and that was very very cool for me yeah i really enjoyed the fact that it was basically a backwards compatibility machine almost you had your Vita games, but it could also play almost every PlayStation portable game. Mm-hmm. It could also play every PlayStation 1 classic. There yep. are a couple you had to, like, jankily make happen. Like, Metal Gear Solid, you could only do if you downloaded it to your PlayStation 3 and then transferred it. Yeah, that's wonky. But, yeah, that's that's how I played a lot of PlayStation 1 classics was on mm-hmm. the go with the Vita. Yeah. Uh, a lot of JRPG, a lot of the Final Fantasies, I bought those and played them on the, the Vita. So I really love that about it. And also, this is something that a lot of people forget. But in the first couple of years of its life, Sony made the digital versions of Vita games $5 cheaper than the physical versions. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. this was the first kind of testing of that. And, of course, kind of brick-and-mortar places freaked out. And yeah, they didn't work out too well. Yeah, they eventually stopped doing that. But that was, like, a really cool little test bed of, like, yeah, if you buy this through the PlayStation mm-hmm. Network, you'll get $5 off or 10% off or something like that. That's awesome. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. I wish it would happen um, nowadays, but it's not going to happen. Right? It won't happen. Uh, I really love that it introduced that cross-play, cross-buy, cross-save. Mm-hmm. Like, you could play Borderlands 2 on your Vita with someone else who's playing on their PlayStation 3. That's yep. pretty cool. Um, and then this is one that I wish had turned out better, but I thought kind of going off that backwards compatibility, the integration of PlayStation Now into it was also really cool for the time that it was, because now it's only PC yeah. and PlayStation 4, but... Um, when I was part, I was part of the beta program for a few months of the PlayStation Now service, and I try, I played it all on my Vita, mm-hmm. and it worked surprisingly well. At the time, there were no games that I cared about playing, but you know, I <laughs> I jumped in, played ten minutes of this game, jumped in, played ten minutes of that game, and I was like, wow, this is actually really cool that this one system has PSP games, PS One, Vita, and now see, I missed that now with PlayStation Three stuff on it. My switch, my switch, my Vita broke like a little bit before that happened, so I missed out on that. Bummer. Yeah. Yeah. Idiot. Idiot. What were some things you didn't enjoy about it? We'll touch briefly on these. Uh, so I think you've mentioned the big one is that every peripheral for it was so expensive. I mean, like, oh, the man, memory yeah. cards. Oh, my gosh. Actually, we go to Amazon right now. They're still absurdly expensive. Like, you would expect. I have the launch prices for them. You read, read off those, actually. I'll find out. So the... the smallest memory card you could get, which would hold probably about maybe two games. Four the gigs. Four gig was yeah. $30. At launch, <laughs> eight gigs was forty five, sixteen was seventy bucks, and a thirty two gig card is one hundred and twenty dollars. Would you say it was thirty bucks for a sixteen gig? No, thirty bucks for a four gig. Thirty bucks for a four gig? Yeah. Oh. And there was a sixty four version that was not ever available in the U S. But that's and they're proprietary, so you only you had to buy the PlayStation yeah. version of these cards rather than most other things at the time, even like the three DS that was coming out. Like you could do SD cards or micro SD cards. Okay, so I found the pricing currently. Um, it's four gigabyte PlayStation Vita memory card today, thirty two ninety five. Oh my god, so stupid! But Amazon's weird because then you can get a sixteen for forty two, or you can get a um, where is it? So I said I said thirty two ninety five for the four gig. You can get an eight gigabyte for twenty three fifty. These prices Ooh. are kind of all over the place and weird. But a Maybe 60... it's just because they're hard to find now. Yeah, a 64 gig card though is uh, is still about 90 bucks. Yeah, and that's still expensive. That's still so expensive. I bought a 128 gig SD card for my Switch that was 40 dollars. Yeah, it's crazy. Way too expensive. That was a. There big were a couple downfall. other things. Yeah, a couple other things too that it it had going against it. One was the price. 
I have a problem with it, but I can see why. The argument that was made, so it came out 249 or 299. The argument that was made was at the time that was also the cost of a PlayStation 3. Mm -hmm. So people were saying, why would I pay that much money for a tiny, less powerful console when I could buy the home version of that for the same price? And it was competing against Nintendo, whose DSs were much cheaper than that as well. Well, 3DS also launched at 249, and they brought the price down to 160 really quick. Yeah. Yeah. But the PSP was always more expensive than the the 3D, the the, uh, the DS. It's it's a a better screen, better, more powerful. Yeah, the hardware is definitely better. Absolutely. So I think the price was justified in that sense. But like you just said, why would someone buy the the portable and they can have the home console? I was always in more of a portable mindset in terms of being a gamer. That. I would. I'm like, oh, cool! I can get a PlayStation Three portable for the same price as a PlayStation Three. Sounds wonderful. I'm going to get that. So that was always kind of how I looked at it. Yeah. But I think the bigger thing was people got pissed off about the 3G model, and like it's like three hundred dollars for a Vita. I'm never going to use that 3G service ever. I had one. I never used it. It was really stupid of me to buy that, but I did. Yep. <laughs> so. Yeah, I think the price was was an issue. It was never a problem for me, but sure, it was definitely a problem. I think the game is also pretty expensive too. They're fifty bucks a piece, weren't they? Uh, most of them, yeah, we're like forty to forty five. I remember Uncharted well, was I fifty bucks them digitally, so yeah, yeah. But what Sony did releasing the instant game collection with PlayStation Now, which mm-hmm. launched with Gravity Rush and Uncharted Golden Abyss. So if you're a PlayStation Plus member, you got those as mm-hmm. part of your subscription. Yep. Um. The last kind of thing that I think it really missed the mark on and could have done so much better with was interactivity with the consoles. So PlayStation 3, it had a couple yeah. things. PlayStation 4, well, right now, if you plug it in, it just says this device is not supported. Does but it really say that? It does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, it remote play, there, there were people who, like, their job is to make sure that this game runs in a specific way on PlayStation Vita mm-hmm. with remote play, which is pretty cool. But I think it could have been a little bit more. There were also talks where, like, you can use your Vita as a controller or as a second screen experience to the game as you're playing mm-hmm. it. So you could like similar to like a Wii U tablet, but yeah. nobody like the Wii U tablet, nobody ever took advantage of it. So I think like there was a, a missed mark on that one, but still a pretty cool little piece of hardware. It was. I enjoyed it. So I want to play games. Yeah. What are your favorite games? Um, I'm going to start off with my favorite game on the Vita. Okay. And the game that I would spend $150 to buy a used Vita just to play this one game again. Okay. Because it can only be played in the Vita, and it's my favorite okay. use of the back touchpad. It's what really is it? It's really simple. It's, I'm building the hype, Chad. It's Luminous. Boost 4? Oh, Luminous. Okay. Luminous is fantastic. It's basically Tetris with dance music. Oh, that sounds boring. It's awesome. Just kidding. Tetris is fun for people that um, aren't me. I love that game so much. And what made it cool is that the back touchpad, you would tap to the beat of the song to to kind of get an extra boost in points or, like, build up a combo. Yeah. And you know how people say, like, oh, I played that game, I lost track of time. I've never had that experience except with Luminous. I played that game for three hours and thought it was, like, 30 minutes. I distinctly remember playing that game and being like, oh, it's noon, I'll play for a little bit, and then I'll, you know, I'll, I'll do some chores around the house. And then I look at the clock like, holy shit, it's 3 o'clock right now. <laughs> and I've done nothing but play this game. It just gets you in this trance. You're so absorbed into it. I've tried playing that game on iOS. because there's, there's an iOS version of that game. Oh, really? And it doesn't. it's not the same because you don't have that back touchpad. Like, it sounds ridiculous yeah. that, oh, you're tapping to be the music. That doesn't sound like much. It really immerses you in the game. And I desperately want to play that game again. It's probably one of my favorite puzzle games, period. Because it combines cool. two of my favorite things, puzzles and dance music. I love dance music. You love tapping and you love dance music. I love tapping. Um, other than that, um, you had Gravity Rush, which I absolutely loved Gravity Rush. Really, really solid game. I think it was on PlayStation Plus not that long ago. It launched on Instant Game Collection when that launched. No, when no, for the PS4, games, the PS4 but... version, I think, though. Because they remastered it for so. PS4. Okay. I mean, but... they released it on PS4, but it, was, it hasn't I... been part of the... Uh... Yeah, because I have it on PS4, but I haven't played it. Because I really want to play the second one as well. But that's a really, really good game. And that was also one of those games where, oh, like, this is a console game. This feels like a console game. It is big and grand, and it's on a handheld. That was awesome. Loved that game. Then you had Uncharted Golden Abyss, which was the first Uncharted game I played. 
really hit the mark in terms of we're going to be a console game and this is an Uncharted game. I can't think of any reviewer that said it was not an Uncharted game. Everyone's like, yep, this is Uncharted. This feels yep. like Uncharted. It plays like Uncharted. Those are probably my three biggest highlight games. That was Outside my first head. game. That Uncharted game was the first yeah. game that I played that had the motion aiming controls too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was, it, it was like, wow, I wish every game did this. And now yep. Zelda did it on mm-hmm. Switch and yep. it broke you for it. And then you have Tearaway. Yeah, Tearaway. That like, game was built for the Vita, and then they rebuilt it for the PlayStation. But is it the same game on the PlayStation? No, it's. I mean, it's it's like one and a half. It has different features, and they okay, but it's still the same story. Like that, said, kinda. I think. Okay, I don't know. I never played it, but neither have I. That was free on PlayStation Plus as well. That's a magical game experience that's only yeah, possible on the Vita. That game is magnificent, and also it really showed off the OLED screen. The colors in that yep. game pop. It's basically, for people who don't know it, you play as a, like, everything is made out of paper in the game. So it's, everything kind of very bright and vibrant, and it works so well with the the graphical capabilities of the Vita, where because it's kind of cartoony and it's all paper, it just looks like everything's kind of floating or is, fl- like, um, the wind's blowing these, like, paper, uh, like, paper grass around. It just looks fantastic. It looks so yep. good. But he had all this great touch um, pad integration where you'd see like a fingerprint and you can kind of or like um, you'd see like a big like circle of just white and you could stick your finger in the back touchpad and it would show up on the screen as yeah, if your finger break was the paper. Where your the paper. Was. So cool. It was, there were some really clever things in that game. Yep, I think it's probably one of the cleverest games I've ever played, I would say. Yep. I love to every once in a while where it would. Like, it, you would be the sun. Your face is the sun. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and every once in a while, I would just turn on the camera, and you you would be making, like, this, like, scowling face as you were playing the game, and you're like, oh, shit, that's my face. And then you would just, like, brighten up and smile so that you look good in the game. <laughs> it's like when There's, you turn on the selfie camera on accident on your phone. The, the whole point of the game is to get to the sun, and they call it the getting to you. They were trying to get to you. Yep. That was, that was fantastic. I think there was other games, though, that... Uh, I also I love Killzone Mercenary. We've talked yes. about this before. Yes, Killzone Mercenaries, yes. Online was the, like probably the most online stuff that you and I have played. Mm-hmm. That was just a good um, shooter. Yeah, was it, was a good just, shooter. it was good. There was also... I played Final Fantasy X Remastered. That was actually one yep. of the cool things that Square Enix... Square Enix still kind of supports the Vita, which is awesome. Mm-hmm. Persona 4 Golden was one of the biggest things on the Vita, and that's where a lot of Absolutely, people spell yeah. the Persona franchise. Uh, I still haven't played it. Still have it downloaded. But I uh, played two, two hours of that game, Persona 4 Golden. Really? And I just stopped because it just wasn't my kind of game. I didn't – two hours in and I hadn't controlled my character yet. I was just reading text between different characters. It yeah. was driving me nuts, so I just stopped playing it. Not a, not a fan. I also uh, really enjoyed playing Borderlands 2. I thought that was so freaking cool. And they made a big deal of that. That's that's back whenever Sony said, hey, we're not going to make AAA games for it anymore, but we'll make third parties make AAA games. Like, we'll bring you <laughs> Borderlands yep. 2. There's that infamous moment where uh, What's-His-Face stands up on stage with the Vita, and he says, Bioshock Vita, oh, and they yes. show up the title screen, and then we never see anything that's about that right. ever again. It was supposed to be like a Final Fantasy Tactics game, but Bioshock instead. Yep. Uh, Metal Gear Solid HD. There was a God of War HD collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a list of the top-selling Vita games. I just want to real quick mention, like, the first 15. Yeah. So number one, with 2.41 million units, is Minecraft. Apparently of course. A huge hit. Because yep, Minecraft it... is the best-selling everything ever. This one, this surprised the hell out of me. The second best-selling game on that system, despite how absolutely trashed it got in reviews, was Call of Duty Black Ops Declassified. Oh, absolutely trashed. Yep. That game was Horrible. Uncharted Golden Abyss was third. Uh, Assassin's Creed 3 Liberation. That was fun. That I like that. Load pres- uh, that was game. a good game. It's number four. I like that one. Little, Bl- Little Big Planet Vita. Yep. Uh, Persona 4 Golden was number six. Need for Speed Most Wanted, number seven. Oh, yeah. Killzone fun. Mercenary, number eight. Final Fantasy 10, 10 2, Remaster, nine. And Mortal Kombat, 10. The Tearaway and Borderlands come in at 11 and 12. FIFA 15, because fucking FIFA everywhere. <laughs> Freedom Wars, that was the last some, uh, the last Sony game that came out on Vita. That was in 2014. And then FIFA Soccer, again, 15. RIP hmm. Vita. So what do, you, what do you think went wrong? 
I just think the the kind of the marketplace has changed a little bit, mm-hmm. and dedicated handheld is not necessarily something that 3DS Sony did fine, is though. looking into. I mean, 3DS not something didn't that Sony's looking at doing. I think Sony is is good in it's concentrating all of its efforts on we're gonna have the best home console experience, mm-hmm. and then VR is kind of its companion to that. But yeah, I don't think they have any interest in going mobile anymore. Yeah, I'd be surprised if they did. Although the leadership has changed, but I don't think it's going to mean anything. Yeah. I wouldn't mind seeing another Sony handheld, honestly. Oh, of course not. I'd love to see one. I I love the PSP. I love the Vita. I really would like to see what they can do again, but probably not going to happen. But I guess my question was like, what do you think? Because I don't think it was just the market. I disagree with that because... 3DS had a hiccup in the beginning, but because it was too expensive, and then it sold it sold sixty, it's at seventy million units now. And I wouldn't consider that a flop by any stretch of the imagination. 3DS kept that company afloat while the Wii U was tanking. And granted, that's not as big as the DS, which sold like well over a hundred. Actually, what did the DS sell? It was well over hundred million. I know that. I think it's the best, second best selling console. I think. Um, so I don't think it was just a market. I think there was other factors like the price i mean i've already i've already listed mine yeah price the peripherals yeah. the interactivity with consoles the... i think also sony gave up on it too early like there was a great lineup of first party games in the first year and then nothing after that like they didn't yeah. seem to put a lot behind it and they just like oh it's not something okay we're, we're done it's over yeah they just kind of gave, gave up, up on, on it way too, too early yeah and they didn't push indie enough like indie is what really got the ps4 going I feel is they had really, really good indie support and Microsoft was not good at approaching that topic yet. And Vita turned out to be a great indie machine. How often did you hear them talk about that? Almost never. It was always, this is going to be a uh, a console-like experience on the go. They really yep. should have pushed this like a really good indie game. Like, hey, you buy those indie games in your PC, buy them on, a, on this little handheld instead. It's going to be a better experience. There could have been a really good market for that, and they didn't do that. And they really should have learned from the DS. DS really got its um, got big because there were these oddball experiences that you couldn't play anywhere else. And the Vita, Nintendogs, and Nintendogs. No, seriously though, Nintendogs. Yeah, and like uh, Brain Age, that kind of stuff. But the, the Vita had really weird gimmicks to play with. Hey, indie developers, we want to see what you can do with this. We'll fund and you know we'll put some very you know clever fifteen dollar games on the Vita. I think stuff like that would have made this a much better system in terms of sales. Yeah. I just don't think we, they even saw the potential of that until they had given up and they're like, oh, but Vita people are – I mean, indie people are still supporting this. Mm-hmm. Uh, fuck, let's, let's push that and fund that. Because that was already a few years into its life cycle by the time PS4 was coming out. So they had pushed it with PS4 and they're like, well, yeah, fuck, we'll push it mm-hmm. on Vita too. But by then it was too late. They had already said, eh, we don't quite see much Holy success crap. in this. The what? What? DS sold 154 million units. Yeah, that makes sense. That's a lot. That's the whole DS li- family, like DS, DS Lite, DSi. Yeah. yeah. So they think I just gave up too early. I think it's kind of the, the gist of it. So happy birthday, Vita. You, on the 15th in the U.S., will be turning mm-hmm. seven? Yeah, seven. No. Six? Six, Six. yeah. Six. You'll Anything be... else you would say about Vita? Um, I want Luminous. I really want to play Luminous, Chad. We have it on iOS, so shut up. No. All right, everyone. Tell us about all your favorite Vita memories. Send us all sorts of shit. Remember to follow us on all of our, instant, our social medias, which for at least a week will be at Between GP <laughs> and remember Between Gaming Podcast. To continue playing this surge, if you want to join us for our yes. game of the month discussion. Send us in your shit. Tell us how you uh, enjoyed the game or didn't enjoy the game, what your favorite parts of it were, and mm-hmm. then we'll all kind of read those and discuss it on the 27th. In the meantime, I hope you guys have a day as great as a gingerbread man dipped in milk and swimming in icing. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.